So you're unseeing that the Women in Literature A-level exam is approaching and you want another opportunity to see exactly what an A-star response looks like so you can uh, get one. Well, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and watch Schofield on Shakespeare. We're gonna build a palace and we'll be so proud A palace where the roar of the crowd will tell the world Our palace will last This video will reference an unseen passage from Celeste Ung's Everything I Never Told You. I will show this extract on screen, but it will be a little easier if you perhaps obtain your own copy. Here's how. Type in Everything I Never Told You into Google. Click on one of the links. There's one from WordPress.com. Hold down Control and F and type in She'd Had The... The passage ends with hold a hammer. Yes, YouTube videos can be helpful, but actually doing some writing yourself and watching a YouTube video can be even more helpful. I'd recommend having a go at writing your own critical appreciation of this passage yourself before perusing my A-star answer. Either way, start reading the passage, which will appear at five second intervals. It's pause time. Before you read my A-star essay, you might be interested in seeing some annotations I made after reading the text for the first time. Do you annotate your text in plenty of detail, making sure you aren't just underlining randomly, but also writing a few perceptive notes in the margins? Press pause to read these annotations now. Time to talk you through my full A-star essay. This extract reveals the prejudice experienced by the female narrator as she tries to study subjects traditionally dominated by men, chemistry and design technology. She is permitted to study chemistry at university, but is initially patronised by the class consisting entirely of men. However, at high school, she was not allowed to study design technology and instead had to endure mind-numbing home economics lessons taught by her mother with the other girls. In spite of the reference to the contraceptive pill, which would change women's lives forever, the passage demonstrates the casual discrimination and objectification experienced by many women during this period, keen to develop a life for themselves beyond marriage and the domestic sphere. In this passage, male teachers and pupils implicitly believe that the narrator and women in general are academically inferior. The university advisor reluctantly agrees that the narrator can try chemistry if you think you can handle it. The verb try seems to imply a belief that the narrator is unlikely to succeed within such a male-dominated academic subject in the longer term. Whilst the subordinate clause after the dash similarly suggests that, due to her gender, he believes she may not be able to cope with the intellectual vigour required. These comments suggest that, even as recently as the 1950s, attitudes towards women in the Western world may not have evolved significantly from the Victorian period, in which the prominent sociologist Professor Patrick Geddes claimed that males may have bigger brains and more intelligence than females. The irony behind these attitudes is that the narrator isn't just able to cope with the academic demands, she is actually considerably more capable than the males in her class. Prior to joining the chemistry class, we learned that she'd had the highest grade in her class and set the curve on every test. 
In other words, she consistently achieved the highest of benchmarks in her tests, against which all other pupils, male or female, compared unfavourably. In addition, a few days into her chemistry course, her solutions never bubbled onto the counter like baking soda volcanoes, and her results were the most accurate. Whereas other male pupils, supposedly more competent, are unable to control their scientific experiments, resulting in a great deal of foaming mess, the female narrator is able to remain remarkably calm, controlled and competent as she develops her expertise in the field. It is notable, however, that the male figures in the passage are not openly derogatory towards the female narrator as she tries to plot her way towards becoming a doctor. Rather, they patronise and belittle in a non-confrontational way. For instance, male pupils would preface multiple sentences with better, better let us help, better let me pour that acid for you, with the implicit meaning that male support will always be essential for the comparatively helpless and certainly less competent female, especially within a dangerous laboratory. Even the instructor is described as smirking, this present participle suggests that he is actively enjoying the idea of a presumptuous female potentially being taught a lesson or two about the consequences of forcefully entering a male sphere, humiliation and mocking. Although a limited number of universities began to accept female students in the late 19th century, this extract highlights the difference between being accepted theoretically and accepted in practice. The instructor tut-tutting when she first enters suggests that although there is presumably no rule against women studying chemistry, they are certainly not actively encouraged to do so. Indeed, the fact that the male pupils rush to the narrator's side to help her with everything seems to suggest that they see her more as a woodhousey and delicate plant, as in Austin's Emma, rather than someone with independent, exciting, intellectual potential. In the narrator's high school, it is significant that one apparently light-hearted reason given for the narrator not being permitted to study design technology is that it would be distracting to the boys in the class. Such a phrase is utterly depressing in its objectification of the female and its implicit lazy resorting to inaccurate representations of male and female sexuality. Historically, society has painted men as having much higher sex drives, with women, at least according to Dr William Acton in the 1860s, not very much troubled with sexual feeling of any kinds. As a consequence of this, women have had to remain resolutely and morally on their guard against dangerous male sexual desires, with society hypocritically demanding that women take responsibility for the male's apparently uncontrollable sexual urges. Hence, Alec feels able to blame Tess for supposedly tempting him by her charms or ways in Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles. In relation to the passage, what this means is that a woman has to be denied pursuing her own passions due to the apparent danger posed to the men by her mere presence. Consequently, at high school at least, the narrator ends up slouched in the back row of the home ec classroom, drumming her fingers. The past participle slouch confirms her dispirited, disinterested body language as she is forced to learn about the domestic sphere rather than something more practical and physical. Meanwhile, the phrase drumming her fingers shows her listlessness. She is itching to use her hands for something practical and useful, such as holding a hammer, but instead is left to futilely tap away and have aspects of her life unfairly dictated to her by her gender. This passage highlights the inherent prejudices at play as recently as 1950s America. In spite of Marilyn pointing out that a proposed switch to design technology wouldn't pose timetabling issues, the principal simply nods and smiles before rejecting her suggestion outright whilst patting her hand. Such behaviour shows men paying lip service to listening to their counterparts and feeling that limp, tactile gestures can somehow compensate for fairness of opportunity. In 1870, Cassell's Household Guide suggested that women in work should have no great physical exertion, no exposure to the weather and no hardship in order to protect the most delicate. Sadly, as this extract shows, more than 80 years later, similar prejudiced attitudes may still have been prevalent within society. 
in order to get an A star, it goes without saying that you need to know exactly what the examiner is looking for. A01, the quality of your argument and writing and your understanding of the extract will determine your level. If you demonstrate an excellent and consistently detailed understanding of text and question and produce a well-structured, coherent and detailed developed argument, you will be positioned within the bottom of level 6 at 26 marks. If you also demonstrate detailed insight into the context in a relevant way, then you move higher up the band, possibly 27 marks. However, to get full marks, you also need the well-developed and detailed insight into language, form and structure. So, how does this A-star essay meet the criteria in the mark scheme? Well, A01, level 6, is about excellent and consistently detailed understanding of text and question. In my introduction, I show this with my points about the female narrator's respective battles to study science and design technology and the prejudice she faces. AO3 requires a consistently developed and detailed understanding of the significance and influence of the contexts in which literary texts are written and received. Although this point isn't yet developed and detailed, this is only an introduction after all, I do recommend incorporating a contextual point within the introduction. After all, the second part of the question requires you to relate your discussion to your reading concerning women in literature. At the beginning of my first main paragraph, I start with a detailed point about the attitude of the male teachers and pupils in the extract, A01. I then follow this up by a quotation and close exploration of this quotation. Good news is A02 requires well-developed and consistently detailed discussions of effects of language, form and structure and consistently effective use of quotations and references to texts critically addressed, blended into discussion. Note how I explore meaning effect of both the verb try and the phrase if you think you can handle it, both imply in different ways that the university advisor believes that the female narrator is unlikely to be able to cope with the intellectual vigour required of the respective courses. The top ban for AO3, context, states not only that the significance and understanding of the context must be consistently developed and detailed, but it has to be appropriate to the question, it has to be relevant. Thus here, I include a contextual quotation from Professor Patrick Geddes, which implies that perhaps the 1950s weren't that different in terms of attitudes towards women as the Victorian period. A01 requires well-structured, coherent and detailed argument consistently developed. Thus here I develop my argument further by pointing out the irony behind the male attitudes. Not only is the female capable, she's actually more capable. And I back this up with some delicious A02 exploration of details from the text, unpicking the relevant quotations, the highest grade in the class, set the curve on every test, her solutions never bubbled onto the counter like baking soda volcanoes, and her results were the most accurate. At the start of my second main paragraph, once again I have a detailed point about the extract and continue to develop my argument, A01. I sound interested in what I'm saying with the phrasing, it is notable however. The connective however is useful in that it shows that I'm clarifying one of my previous points and thus producing a more nuanced argument. This essay must have a great deal of close analysis of textual detail, AO2. Thus here I unpick the multiple sentences beginning with better and the single significant word smirking. As ever though, I want to incorporate contextual insight within every paragraph. In this paragraph, I make a reference to the supposed enlightenment of universities from the late 19th century, as well as a deft reference to a 19th century novel. In Jane Austen's Emma, 
that old hypochondriac Mr Woodhouse claims that young ladies are delicate plants. And so I show off my writing flair with my transformation of this quotation into a Woodhousian delicate plant, which seems to be how the other chemists see our narrator. Have a look at the colour coding within the final main paragraph of the essay. AO1, point making, understanding of text and argument, is in yellow. AO2, quotations and analysis of quotations, is in blue. AO3, context in green. The key is to have an overall balance of all three and to integrate them together seamlessly so that your argument fits and flows. An outstanding A-star essay needs an outstanding, punchy, final concluding paragraph. Don't rehash, regurgitate previous points, but aim to tie things up together and include one final piece of contextual insight, as I do here in my reference to Cassell's Household Guide from 1870, which may imply that, sadly, similar prejudice attitudes may have been pre prevalent 80 years later. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, giving you yet more ideas about how to get an A-star for the critical appreciation of women in literature, English literature A-level. Many thanks.